<laughs> All right, well, we'll see how long this connection holds out. Everybody's having trouble with their uh, live feed here. But I tried again, and it looks like it's going. So we have uh, Carol Bundy and Jeanette Finnicum here to speak. Uh, Brian Hyde will be among the speakers. There's uh, Brandon, Captain Carl. There's David Fleeman. There's Neil Wampler, Todd Applegate, Amy's down here. Hey, Amy. Let's go say hi to Brian. So the speaker's supposed to commence here in a little bit. Hi, Brian. We're live on Facebook. Would you give us an introduction for tonight's event? Well, I'll do my best. Right. Brian Hyde. Okay. Good, good guy. My good tonight's friend. event is uh, from Bunkerville to Malheur, and it's a chance to, to hear from two of the really central players to all of the things that happen in Bunkerville and in Malheur, but we don't hear as much about them, and that is uh, the women behind the men who have been in the headlines. So we'll be hearing from Carol Bundy, we'll be hearing from Jeanette Finnicum, and both of them have a very unique perspective, and I think they have some really important things to share. Thanks. Brian Hyde from Loving Liberty, and uh, who's next? Good to see you again. Good to see you. And also, you're uh, you're back to broadcasting with your uh, your partner on air daily? Yes. And yeah. give, tell everybody Loving where. Liberty with Brian Hyde airs daily on 1640 AM in Salt Lake City. Um, not everybody lives within the sound of that broadcast signal, but we do podcast it on SoundCloud, on no. Twitcher, oh, and on, tu on no, TuneIn. No. So if you were to go to SoundCloud and Google Loving Liberty with Brian Hyde, there's a daily podcast that we put up every day. And uh, it's wonderful to be back on the air. Awesome. Well, I've not been staying caught up with you, but I'll rectify that soon. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Brian. Thank you very much. See ya. Thanks. <laughs> Hey, Beth. Good to see you. It's our crowd. So we should uh, probably start an event soon. Hey, hey. Good. Good. Good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Hello. There's Carol down there. I can easily, everything I do is easily. Let's walk out. <laughs> Let's go look at the, the table. Can I get your name and email address too? It's the Constitution of Pocket Conspiracy on my dad's on the cover. That's awesome. And these are actually going to help fund our wrongful death case. So we're really excited about those. I have a lot of Constitution. Can I get, we're on live. Can I come over and video you? Sure, yeah. Awesome. Introduce yourself for people that might not know who uh, LaVoy Finnicum's daughter is. Sure, I'm Tara Tenney. I am LaVoy's daughter. And I'm excited to be here at this event. And thank you for everybody that's watching out there in the world, wherever you are. We appreciate you following the story and sharing with your friends. And we're just really excited to have this opportunity to have our voice heard just a little bit more. And I'm really excited about this. It's a pocket constitution that's custom made with my dad on the front and the back and on the inside and the 
the back telling our story. And this yeah. is going to fund, yeah, help awesome. fund our wrongful death him, case. And if you'd like to get one and share and um, pass these along to your friends, you can go on our family website. It's one cowboy stand for freedom.com. So I'm really excited because this is the first time I've got to actually hold it and see it. So. It's really exciting. Very nice. Yeah. And uh, the book your dad wrote, I read it here just uh, a month or two ago. It's an excellent book, and uh, it, it's engaging the whole way through. Yeah. No let up in it. Yeah. And, uh, it's a very it's good book, and this is actually the second edition, so it comes with photos in the center, an epilogue, and a prologue telling about his upbringing and what got him to Oregon. So it's a little little more than the first edition, so it's a really good, very good read. Um, and when, when did your dad write that book? How, how many years ago? He was writing it uh, shortly before, you know, his mind had been mulling the ideas of trying to teach principles of liberty with an emotional slant. And he was working on it around Bunkerville time, and it was published maybe nine months before he found himself in Oregon. Mm. So if I had that timeline right, it's right, right around there. I met your dad in 2014, and uh, I was wearing my What Matters Worldwide shirt. I was doing broadcasting there at UCY.TV at reallibertymedia.com now. <laughs> And he came up and came to me and asked, hey, who are you and what are you doing? And I said, what matters worldwide? What matters to you? And he told me, it matters how you stand. Oh, yep, that's his famous quote. It doesn't matter that how is it ends. Famous. It matters, matters how, how you stand. stand. Why is this revised? I have this book. So it's the second edition. Yes. Um, it has a prologue and an epilogue written telling about his upbringing and then what got him to Oregon eventually ending in the tragedy. It has pictures in the middle there. And so that's what the special second edition is. Okay. Do you have a website where you can make a donation? Yes, we have a family website that we set up long before you went to Oregon. It's One Cowboy Stand for Freedom. And I could write that down for you, or let's you know see, does my mom saying? have it on here? Yep, it's right there yes. on her card. And I don't know how, and I don't even know if I can help, but somehow the word of this going on to me, to me, nobody knows about it. I thought when I got here, we weren't going to be able to talk this. This place should be packed. We went to a constitutional meeting where there was about, what, eight of us Monday night? And that's the only no, there were more than that. There were like 15 people. Okay. Well, our original eight, and there were some people that came in. Hey, I'm streaming to Facebook. Can yeah. I show you guys on? Well, I guess so. <laughs> Would you uh, introduce yourself and, and tell uh, tell everybody your duties here right now? Hi, I'm Lisa Heitzman, and I am with the event, Harvester Events, and so we're the ones helping put on this event and Very nice. so that everybody could hear the stories and learn more about what they can do to help. Thank you. How many people do we have uh, signed in so far? Um, I think we have 150. Very nice. Probably already Very nice. in there. and. And so there's a few still coming. So. Okay. I didn't sign in. I snuck in. So. Oh. <laughs> well, let's get your name. Huh? Would you like to put my name down? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> here you go. Right here. Y'all thought I was kidding, huh? Vince Easley. The second. Yes. Oh, I am. the second. Well, we better put that in more. It is. That's yeah. important. I'm the only Vince and Easley the second that I think I And so exists. who are you doing this for? The press? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, minor media, um, reallibertymedia.com, and I was in Bunkerville in 2014, and oh. I've been covering that. I was in Vegas for the trial. Um, from September, I got to Vegas, and so I, I was on the witness list, number 303 for the for the Bundys. And when it, when the trial was dismissed with prejudice, I, I just felt like there was still more to do, and I wasn't ready to go home. So I got almost 16 months on the road, and I'm I'm headed to Texas uh, this next week, and then home to Arkansas. Oh. Wow. Next month. So you've been all over awesome. then. I yes, I went from from Arkansas to Texas to Tennessee to Spokane, Washington, Oregon, California, Vegas. I've been up to Denver and then back to Vegas and then back uh, back up here. And in the meantime, I spent 11 days and then another 28 days in the desert and Riverside. Um, acting sheriff, I appointed myself. I elected myself, but I was the only one voting, so it was, it, it was a landslide victory. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you guys over the head Thank you.
motivation within us to be able to maintain and preserve liberty. And that is one of the reasons why I, I look up to LaVoy. I never met him in person, but I've had the chance to rub shoulders with his family. I spoke about constitutional sheriffs at his six-month event and then the year event up in Oregon. And throughout that process, I feel like I've gotten to know him a lot better. And he epitomizes that great quote from Benjamin Franklin, the almost I, I don't. seal of the United States. I, I, and that I says, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And LaVoy was obedient to God. He followed the spirit and he did what he felt was right. I'm grateful for the example of the Bundys and the Finnicums and, and their families. They've demonstrated their love of faith, family, and freedom through their sacrifice of either using or losing their lives to lay a foundation of securing liberty for the rest of us. And we are very grateful to hear from them later on this evening. We'll begin tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll go ahead and lead that. And after we finish the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, Jeremy Nelson is going to give us our opening prayer. So if everyone would please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. She is the wife of the late Bert Smith of Ogden and recently launched Loving Liberty to advance these principles through events, radio, print, and social media. She has a special appreciation for ranchers, farmers, and producers, and in 2016 she co-founded the Range Rights and Resource Symposium, which is hosting its third annual event next week in Modesta, California. I'm grateful to know Kathy personally. It's been fun to get to know her a little bit better recently. And she is willing to speak up. George Washington once said that if the, if the freedom of speech is taken away, then dumb and silent, we may be led like lambs to the slaughter. 
I'm grateful for Kathy, for Carol, for Jeanette, for those that are speaking tonight who are willing to speak up and not remain silent. So with that, let's invite Kathy. great honor for me to introduce my good friends Carol and Jeanette, but first I want to thank the organizers of this event, um, Joe Carey and Brian Hyde, and thank you Garrett too for organizing this event. Thank you for organizing it so that we could all be here together and hear from our great friends, Carol and Jeanette. And I appreciate all of you coming and for your support for them, and I feel um, very humbled to be in this room with all of you, your great patriots. I first met Carol when my husband took me to Bunkerville over 10 years ago to meet Cliven and Carol and her family. And they gave us such a warm welcome. They rolled out the red carpet and feasted us with this big barbecue dinner, and that's Carol's style, and invited Bert to teach everyone around the campfire there. And I even have that, uh, that evening on a little audio file recording. And so it's just a, a moment that I'll never forget, first meeting the Mondays and realizing that we were all in this together. That was 10 years ago. So in 2014, we spoke with Clyde and Carol and by phone. We go to Bunkerville, but we stayed in touch with them by phone. And when their home was surrounded by, by uh, enforcers and government agents, um, we knew that Carol and Cliven were not exaggerating what was happening to them because we knew that they were good, honest, God-fearing people. And they were under extreme pressure. And when Carol told me one day, she said, we don't take a step to the right or to the left without praying about it first. And I vowed that day that I would make a prayer like that part of my life or try to. I've also seen um, Carol firsthand in an airport. I've flown with her and seen how she's treated by uh, the TSA people as a domestic terrorist because her name is Bunny. But I've seen how she interacts with those people um, with grace and kindness. And again, I wish that I were more like you, Carol. And then Bert and I met LaVoy Finnecum in September of 2015 after he released of his gripping novel, Only by Blood and Suffering. And we knew that we were meeting a kindred spirit, a very gentle man, and he and Bert hit it off right up, right away. And then a few short months later, Jeanette stopped by our home on the way home from the Malheur Refuge. She was headed back to Arizona and stopped to visit me and Bert. That was the first opportunity we had to meet Jeanette. She told us how she felt so peaceful about what was happening in here and that she was in total support of the boy and what he was doing in his men to stay and to teach. And the very next day, he was shot and killed. And I thought, too bad the boy didn't go home with Jeanette that day. Um, they had no idea that their husband and their dad, Jeanette, and the children would be um, would lose his life at the hands of our very own government. But she has vowed, like Carol, to keep helping to share this message. And I admire Jeanette and her family, Tara's here too, for finding their voices and being brave and courageous and powerful as they share the boys' message. I also know that there are others who have um, lost their life, lives and loved ones in battle. And usually it's in battles not of our own choosing, but we are all in this battle together. And so I applaud you and I applaud all of you for being part of it. I hope that you'll find a bigger way to take part and support not only the Christian family, but this fight for freedom that we're all in together. So thank you for your examples of courage and for being with us here tonight and sharing your stories. We love you and appreciate you. So we'll have Carol go first. But 
I used to teach school, and so I kind of wanted to wander back and forth, maybe even right on the chalkboard a little bit. But they want me here on the camera, so I get to keep me here. Wow. I'm overwhelmed with the support. Thank you. Um, as, as Kathy said, I'm Carol Bundy White. I'm the Rancher Choir. But so I guess you can just call me the Rancher Choir. It's a lot easier to remember. And I have a fondness in my heart for these cowboy hats that I see out here. I have a fondness in my heart for patriots. I feel kind of sorry for those of you that live in this big city because I can't wait to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm grateful to be here today and to share our story, to share maybe what direction we're going. Um, and, and with God's help, we're going to prevail. My, my, originally, they wanted me to talk about what makes me so strong. And I need to tell you, I came from a strong family. I came from a strong mother who taught me how to be strong and uh, maybe didn't allow me to be. Um, I was telling someone a story where they always had a little struggle and my mother said, Carol, you just got to put yourself up by the bootstraps. And I said, Mom, I've done that so many times, my bootstraps are broken. She called a couple hours later, I called her and I said, Mom, guess what? I've got some holes in my boots and I pulled them on and they're going to last for a while long. <laughs> That's where the strength comes. One of my favorite cowboy quotes is, the best preparation for tomorrow is doing your best today. So as you are with me today, let's saddle up and ride. Let's ride, let's ride with spirit, let's ride with strength, and let's ride with conviction, because it's going to take all of that. And I ask you, doesn't a rancher, a wife, a rancher's wife, a mother to 14 children, a grandmother to 66, and family? A great grandmother to four and counting, a domestic terrorist, and an unindicted folk and spirit doesn't that make you strong? <laughs> 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 Kicked out of this country that the, the, the pilgrims had established. 
to their assembly that they loved, they were called to leave. But when they arrived in Utah, they got on their knees, they thanked God for a safe journey, they thanked God for a place where they could build homes, they dug their, their fingers down into the dirt, and they went to they planted gardens, they got a water infrastructure going, they built homes, they learned to love their neighbor. Where did they get this spirit? What makes them so strong? And where is the conviction now? And it's not now from our ancestors, from the way you see that they have this. In 2014, we went to said we had a bunch. We are not going to go to court anymore. There's no justice in the courts. We have the right to run our cattle. It wasn't a privilege to run our cattle. We own the rights to run our cattle. For some of you that may not understand, that means that we, we have the right to the water, the forage, and the access. Did we own the land? No. Did we have the right to run? Yes. And it's vital to the state and their best rights. And we believe that you all have the privilege of enjoying the county, the, the fishing, the recreation, whatever else, right along with those beautiful farm cows that we have. My husband's family, first, uh, and we'll go back a little bit because I've been myself. My husband's family settled in Bunkerville, Nevada, on the Arizona Strip, and my family settled in Wyoming. They were poor. They had very little, but they were strong in spirit, and they loved liberty. They were cowboys. That was their way of life. They loved it. It was a custom and culture. Discussing the puppy. And I don't think you're not going to see it joining my mind. No, don't talk to you. Don't talk to me. Huh? Um, anyway, <coughs> but say. they loved liberty, and they loved freedom, and they stood for that, and they were. They loved that life of being a cowboy and living. They too had dirt under their nails and living and freedom in their blood. So she's gonna they had it. spirit, <laughs> they had strength, and they had conviction. Now I might add that the other, uh, we call them the Bundy 19, and the wood. They have a rich heritage too. They had professions of their own. They were electricians, they were heavy equipment operators. Um, construction workers, mechanics, firefighters, artists, IT techs, husbands and fathers, but they had one common thread that ran between them and held them strong, and that was that they loved their country and they loved their neighbor and they were willing to do whatever it took for freedom of this country. Our rights to our ranch started in 1877 when the Buddy family uh, arrived in Buffalo, Nevada. And, and when we stood, we didn't stand just for the money. We stood for all the people in Cuff County, Nevada. We stood for all the people in the state of Nevada. And we stood for all of the, these Americans because our rights are being taken away by our federal government. And the, it's swelling and the overreach is so powerful. And like, like Kathy said, we didn't go into this without prayer. We didn't look left or right without asking our Heavenly Father what He would like us to do. And I was, I was, uh, had the impression that I would have angels from both sides of the veil stand with us. And I can remember that day on the 12th of April, sitting in a Hummer, going to meet with the sheriff of our county. And I can remember looking, thinking, I didn't order this harm cover, and I know I can't afford it. I didn't know where it came from. And I didn't know that angels had tattoos all over their bodies. And I felt the spirit so strong, and I knew what we were doing. I, I just knew that what we were doing was the right thing to do. We had led with our county sheriff to do his job, to protect our life, liberty, and property. No response. We faced down the track of government. We went full military combat uniform, stole our cattle, ripped out some of our water infrastructure, 
kill many of our cattle and separated a lot of mamas from their babies. And they were cruel in how they treated them. They terrorized my family and friends with high-tech communications, cyber spies, physical and verbal threats. Now we believe the sheriff has the ultimate power in our county. And we pled with him many times, saying all you have to do is say no when they will be. But we learned through court and through a lot of papers that he just wiped his hands up and said, the federal government, I guess you go ahead and do that. Um, we exercised our First Amendment right. We exercised our uh, freedom of speech and our right to to peacefully assemble. We also exercised our right to the Second Amendment, and that's the right to bear arms and to protect our, our life, liberty, and property. The patriots from across the nation came and stood beside us. And you know what? No one was harmed. No shot was fired. The only thing we had was God on our side and a whole lot of stubborn men. And we won. And we brought our cattle home and they're still out there today. <laughs> and it all came because there was strength in the spirit and there was conviction. Still today, all that we stood for is peace and gentlemen. Even though my husband, my sons, and most of the others are out of, out of prison, and we're very, very, very grateful for that. It's a miracle of its own. The fight isn't over. The federal government doesn't give up that easy. But as people have asked me, I'll say, you know what? I had angels that came from across America to stand with me the first time, and I will have more angels. They will come and stand with me if they come again. Yeah. And I was yeah. As they sit in prison, we found out that you're just automatically guilty. There's no innocent until proven guilty. You're just guilty because they have you in there. And I have never asked my husband, and he has never told me, but I know they're changed men because of what they endured and went through. Um, the very government that was established to protect our rights placed my family in very cruel cool circumstances. The Bundy 19 gave up their freedom for almost two years to defend your freedoms. Throughout all of this, they didn't grieve for themselves. I don't know how many of them went to visit them and why they were um, incarcerated, but they were, they were almost cheerful. Of course, cheerful because they were glad to have a visitor, but they were cheerful because they knew what they were doing was right. They didn't grieve for it. They, they did grieve for our nation, and they grieved for their little wives and their little babies and for their families that were struggling. And I'm so thankful now that most of them are home. It's a struggle, but it was worth every minute of it. We still remain on the terrorist watch list, as Kathy said. When I fly, I can't pre-print my ticket. I have to wait when I get there. And then they call in the TSA, and then they print me out a ticket, and it has four S's on the bottom. Now, those four S's are supposed to flag me into something special, but, you know, it, I think it does. So I look at the cap half full instead of half empty. And I, I say that those four S's make me a special person. It makes me a special person because they call the special TSA agents to watch over me. And they give me a special pat down. <laughs> and then they stand right there beside me to make sure I'm safe till I get on the flight. And then before I get on the flight, they say this flight was randomly select, selected for another search. So they also inconvenience anybody that flies with me. They have to show their ID again, they get their purse, their wallet, and everything searched. 
just to keep me safe because my ticket has the bonuses on it. I can tell you though that I went to uh, Canada. I have a daughter that lives in Canada. Um, the four S's didn't protect me too much then. I stood at the border for four and a half hours before they would let me back into my own country. They had to get special permission from Washington, D.C. I don't know who's pushing the buttons, but you know what? I have spirit, I have strength, and I have conviction. And if that's what it takes in this country for me to fly, for me to see my, my family, I think I'm gonna do it. I'm not gonna let them put me down. I'm not gonna let, me, let them embarrass me. And I've already decided that the next time I fly, I'm gonna to go to the front of the line and I'm gonna say, hey everybody, I'm Carol Bundy. I'm, on, I'm special, I get four S's on mine. Do you have four S's on yours? And because of that, I'm very apologetic, but because I'm on your flight, you get searched. I don't know what they'll do, but it'll be fun. <laughs> my son Neil says, I didn't stand so my children wouldn't have to. I stood so my children would know how to. That's Whoa. good. That's pretty good. So, what do we do today? Where are we headed and what's our next move? Well, we have a decision. Do we forgive and forget, or do we hold them accountable? Well, we have filed a lawsuit with the state of Nevada because, you know, they allowed a, a monument, a national monument, to be layered over our ranch. That gives them one more uh, way that they can try to push cattle off. But, you know, sometimes it's good just to let God take control. Sometimes it's good to let them answer to him. We haven't made a decision yet. It's a long battle ahead of us. I, I say they took two years of our life. My husband said in jail for seven hundred days. Somebody needs to be held accountable for that. My families and the families of, of the others that were in there have suffered financially. We found out that my son, who had a, a very good thriving business in Phoenix, the federal government went to his clients and threatened them if they continued to do business with him. Amen. And he almost lost his business. Um, I think that the federal government's a little bit afraid of us. <laughs> uh, my son Dave had just completed his commercial pilot's license, but because he's not been able to fly for two years, that now sets in jeopardy. Um, my son Ryan is going to run for governor in Nevada, and we're going to. <laughs> Let anyone get the best of her. But a woman of strength 
gives the best of herself to everyone. A strong woman makes, makes mistakes and avoids the same in the future, but a woman of strength realizes that life's mistakes can also be God's blessings and capitalizes on them. A strong woman walks surefootedly, but a woman of strength knows God will catch her when she falls, and he did catch me many times. A strong woman wears a look of confidence on her face, but a woman of strength wears grace. A strong woman has faith that she is strong enough for the journey, but a woman of strength has faith that it is in the journey that she will become strong. I wanted to thank us. There's many that served us in many ways. Thank you for the for the financial support, the generosity, for the prayers. Imagine the, the strength that you could just feel on my husband and my sons would say in jail that they knew people were praying because there was just strength. They just had strength and they knew that people were praying. Uh, there are still two men incarcerated that were found guilty. One man was sentenced to 50 some years. It's a life sentence for him. No 60 years. Todd Ingalls not been Pray for them. They need your prayers. Another cowboy quote is we make it make it knock down on the outside, but the key to living in victory is to learn how to get up on the inside. And my desire as a rancher's wife is to endure is to endure with dignity and strength. To have those who know me say she was unstoppable. Not because she did not have failure or doubts, but because she continued in spite of them. Do not let anyone break your soul. You have to stand on your own two feet, and you have to fight, and you have to know that it's right when you do it. You have to have that conviction that comes with that. And you have to have some dirt out of your fingernails and some liberty in your soul. Above all, please pray for our sacred constitution. I love this land of liberty. We must preserve it for our posterity. We must stand together for freedom. It's a battle that must be won. Liberty is in your blood as well. We all have a story to tell. So let's do whatever it takes. This is spirit, my friends. This is conviction, and this is strength. It is your time to come forward now and to defend and to make right and to teach your neighbor. This is your time to decide which side you're on. There will be no fence setters. There's no fence setters. Are you on, on the side of freedom and liberty? Are you on the side of the divinely inspired Constitution? Have you read the Constitution? Have you shared the Constitution? Do you know the Constitution and how important it is? Do what is right, let the consequence follows. Angels above us are silent, don't speak. There's much work to do. But once again, using my cowboy lingo, let's saddle up and ride, cowboy. Let's get her done. Let's get her done with spirit, with strength, with conviction, and let's do whatever it takes. Thank you.
What's up, Michael? Hey, Jeremy. This button does. <laughs> but Lavoy traveled all the way down from Salt Lake. We live down in Kangas, which is about six to five hours from here. And he had come up to Salt Lake to attend a conference for our work. And he had been wrestling with the headlines, and he didn't know what Clyden was all about. And he really wanted to understand what it was he was doing and why he was doing it. And so he took off from the conference and drove all the way down to Bunkerville. And there he knocked on the door and was welcomed inside. And he asked Cliven all kinds of questions. And I'm sure Cliven doesn't remember Lavoy. There were hundreds of people there. But Lavoy decided after being invited to ride that that's what he was going to do. And so he came home, and he was home about 10 or 11 at night. And he said, Jeanette, I'm going to ride tomorrow morning with the Cowboys for Clyde and Bundy. And I said, OK. And I can remember, you know, because I hadn't been following any of this in the news. We didn't have cable. And so I hadn't followed the story at all. I was just busy being mom. And he got up about 5.30 in the morning and took off for Bunkerville. And I remember him telling me that he was the first cowboy that arrived of the ones that rode that day. He quietly saddled up his horse and waited for all the others to arrive. And I remember him telling me about when they stopped midway, how they knelt and prayed, and how he could feel the spirit of the Lord with them, the whole group of men that were there. And there's this wonderful picture. I don't know who took it of Lavoie riding that day in Bunkerville. But you can see him sitting so erect and his whole on, is on top of his horse. He's just straight riding. And the biggest smile on his face. He was so happy to be there. Who, I don't know, who took that picture or captured that moment of the joy. You can see the joy on his face. And he said he left after the cows were let loose and he just rode back to his trailer, loaded up, and came home. And I was so grateful to have him come through that door because our experience at home was a whole lot different than the peace that he just 
Jesus Christ. <laughs> we were sitting at home in fear for his life because all we got was, I think it was Pete Santilli or um, uh, one of those internet uh, news people. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the name. Uh, and that was all that was available to us. We hovered, all of us kids, and uh, the kids were hovered around the computer, and we were standing there waiting for the next little glimpse of whatever, or a little tidbit, and we're being faced with all of these armed men tacked out, all these hundreds of police cars driving by, watching all of these roadblocks. I had a girlfriend, Colleen Stubbs, she might not have wanted me to tell her name. <laughs> Hi, Colleen. Colleen was there. And she was calling me every little while, and I was calling her just back and forth, wanting to know what was happening from moment to moment. And uh, all of a sudden, she, she says, oh my gosh, Jeanette, we've come to the wash, and i am taken a wrong turn, and I'm in the FBI camp. <laughs> and I can't get out, they won't let me out. And I'm going, oh my gosh, Colleen, how far are you from everybody? Can you see anything? I was so worried for the boy. And all of a sudden, then the cell phones were wiped out, and nobody could talk or send information in or out. And there was a no-fly zone, and all we got was InfoWars. <laughs> I finally remember. This is the over 50 frame memory background. But anyways, InfoWars, that's who we were listening to. And that's all we got. That's the only information that we got until the boy got home. So that was David Knight for the wars there. And he was so thrilled to have been there. He was so grateful that he got to meet Clive and talk to a couple of his sons and get to understand what it was he was doing and why he was doing it. Because that's not what we heard in the press. That's not what was demonstrated in the press. And that whole moment changed my husband's life. We'll go ahead and the day before his 55th birthday, January 26, 2016. He had gone to Oregon to stand peacefully for property rights, for our ever-disappearing liberties, for who he considered to be his neighbor, Dwight and Susie Hammond, and for you and for me. 
Upon impact, he left his truck alone with his hands in the air. He was surrounded by 30 plus highly trained armed officers. There were snipers in the trees. They had planned this for days. They had prepared the trees to hold their sniper rifles. They had been out there organizing this kill stop. Without mercy, they shot him three times in the back while his hands were still in the air. A planned roadblock with no warrant, no broken laws, he was murdered, assassinated, with no due process and no trial by a jury. That is the part we struggle with at times sometimes now, watching the not guilty verdicts come in. He was not afforded that privilege to have his case heard before a jury of his peers. We have hired Morgan Philpott and Rick Kerber to represent our family in the wrongful death lawsuit for the murder of my husband. We have filed the complaint and we are going to move forward with all of this. It is a long process. It's a long process. I am having to learn new things. Well, not new. It's more of the same. Patience. Patience. We have teamed up also with an organization called Center for Self-Governance. And they have been working very closely with our family in putting together um, a documentary on the boy's life, um, the incident from Malheur, and what happened and transpired there. They've interviewed quite a few people. Let's see if I can operate this again. Um, so I can show you a little bit about what we are working on. Hello everyone, this is Lloyd for the coat. It's uh, September of 2014, I'm out here on my, my ranch. It's great out here. You know, I've never been one to, to try to cause problems. I can get in trouble in school, I always raise my hand, I always stood in line. To this day, I do not have a speeding ticket. But it doesn't take too much to see that large storm clouds are gathering. Here is a non local trespass vehicle, $92 and change, $180, $1,125 and change. It's not there. I didn't buy it from them. This tank here has been sabotaged. The land came in here. The tank, they, they drained it. It's stolen. We have been classified as domestic terrorists. These are real lives. These are real people. They're going to pull everybody's crazy rights. Everybody will lose their, their jobs here. Look what they're doing over to that family, the Hammond family. They threw them in jail. Tremendous amount of fines. This isn't America. This isn't what we are. No matter how long or short my days may be, I am going to live as a free man. I promise you this, I will not back down. I will not capitulate. I will die before. I'll sleep well at night. We all only have one life. Maybe we'll get a chance to look each other in the eye. <laughs> this is not a, a light thing that I'm doing, but I counted the cost. And I'm willing to pay. The 
buttons don't do well. The boy had a, a very strong character. He was brave. He was amazing. He's, I look back and I, I see these um, little bits of film put together and I am in awe <coughs> of his strength and his courage and his conviction. And I hope that I can continue just a little bit in the way that he has. Our family wants to see justice and accountability for those involved in the boy's murder. We need to hold those responsible who have lied overstepped, misused, and illegally abused their positions of authority as they have continued to uncover all of these politically motive, motivated illegal activities, we need to hold all of them accountable. Those who are in these positions of power, we the people need to insist and demand that our elected and hired officials are held accountable for their illegal activities and for not upholding the Constitution of the United States. They need to be removed from office or their jobs, not be, just be transferred back and forth between government agencies as we have seen in the cases of Dr. Red and the Bunnies. That's so much, so much we're learning about what has happened. The Wooten Report is very enlightening. We need to demand to see the rest of that Wooten Report. We need to know what these people are doing, but they operate behind a cloak, behind a screen of deception. The media is in cahoots. There are so much, there is so much that we need to know and understand about what has been happening. But when I had been uh, talking with Dr. Red's son, Jay, and Jay was informing me of all these different things that have been going on, and I was quite surprised at some of the information that I was reading, and about how the head of BLM was just transferred over to the head of the Forest Department. And when things got a little rough again, they decided to make another switch and switch the, the guy that had just switched over to the Forest Department back over to the BLM Department. We the people have short memories and we don't remember what's happening, so we just, we forget and they're able to go back and forth like this and, we, and we're no the wiser. And we need to become more actively involved in holding these people accountable. You know, if they were in the private sector, they would lose their jobs, right? They would lose their jobs. They would not be transferred to another division within the government, They'd only to be jail. transferred back. They'd be in jail. They would be in jail for, for some of their illegal activities. Now, I don't know what I've done to this PowerPoint. Oh, my son-in-law, Tom. touch on a few of the things because there's not enough time to really talk about everything. Um, and I really don't want to kind of rehash all of it too much. Uh, I've traveled the country for the last two years talking about my husband because I wanted you to know the real man, Lemoy Finnecum. And who was the real man, Lemoy Finnecum? He was a loving son father, husband, we're parents of 12 children. I have 25 grandchildren and one more next week. <laughs> so it'll be up to 26. Not as much as Carol. <laughs> I, think she's, I don't think I'll ever reach Carol's. But he was an active father in the home. He was home every day. We worked with therapeutic foster care um, children for 18 years. And so he was there every day. And I am so grateful that I can say that I got to spend all of that time with him. Because I don't know how I would feel now if I had not had that extra time. That's the type of man he was. 
he wanted to share his life with, with me and with his kids, and he was a hard worker. He dreamed of having and owning his own ranch from the time he was about eight years old, because going through some of his journals, I've discovered uh, where the LV bar came to be, and now he was about eight years old, and he was doodling and decided to uh, create his own brand for his ranch one day, and they're just, they're his initials. And then every good brand has a bar in it, right? So it's LV Bar. So he dreamed about having a ranch and being a good father and being a good man, serving a mission. I remember one year for Christmas, um, we were kind of going through some of these things. I don't remember why, but there was this little blue piece of paper that he wrote prior to going on his mission, and it was all of his goals in life. And he had reached all of them, but for some reason he felt like he hadn't measured up quite to what he wanted to be. But I was so impressed that in the mind of an 18-year-old boy would want his main goals in life were to serve a mission, to be married in the temple, to a good wife, it said. So I hope I qualify. And to be a good father and to have his own ranch someday. And I believe it said to be the, as good a father as his own is how it read. And that's where he felt like he hadn't quite measured up because he just loved his dad so much. And he had learned so much about what it meant to be a strong man from his dad. And he had been divorced, so he thought he had just fallen just a little bit short of, of being a good dad. But he hadn't. We had 12 wonderful children and over 60 wonderful foster young men in our home over those years. He was the epitome of someone you would want your young man to become. He was just an amazing man. And I remember after he said that to me, I said, I'm going to give this back to him. And I put it in a picture frame, and I wrapped it up, and I put it under the tree that year for Christmas. And that was my gift to him. Because he certainly had reached every single one of those goals that he had set for himself, even though he didn't think so himself. I wanted to be the one to tell the story about who my husband was. I didn't want the media to be in control of that narrative. The media is not in the business of telling the truth. Their job, their motive, and their mission is to create illusion in order to blur our reality. I believe that with everything every being in my soul. I believe that. <coughs> I, I would have never maybe said that three years ago because I was a stay-at-home mom. I was not out in public. I'm not a public speaker. I didn't know much about uh, politics, and I, I really don't know a whole heck of a lot now. I just know that it's uh, crooked. That's how I see it now. The media is crooked. They don't tell the truth. They twist it, manipulate the minds of us, the American people. And we need to start digging a little bit deeper to find the truth, because their agenda is to not give us that truth. Some of the other challenges that I've had um, has been dealing with the FBI. I didn't expect to be followed by the BLM Law Enforcement Division or the FBI, but I certainly have been followed to events in Delta, Colorado. And just the other day after my dog was shot and killed, I received a, a visit and I was informed by that law enforcement officer that they had been contacted by the BLM Law Enforcement Division to keep an eye on me and my comings and goings and whoever else might be coming and going from my home. Me, mother of 12, grandma of 25. I'm going, what do, what, how, how scary am I? I? I could not believe that 
they would go to this kind of energy and, and, and resources, our resources, to watch our family and to watch what we were doing. I have been label lynched as a sovereign citizen, profiled as a domestic right-wing extremist, and judged by the American public for standing with my husband as a dual federalist. I have been labeled anti-government and put on their watch list. I am not anti-government. I am, as was my husband, for pro-responsible government. And we believe in the Constitution to be the law of the land, and it is our responsibility as its citizens to stand up and uphold and protect it. Here, here. Insulated from my ranching duties for almost two years because the BLM refused to follow their own federal regulations or acknowledge that I was my husband's wife and widow. They denied that I had any right to that permit and pretended that it was simply terminated upon his death. That, that whole thing was unbelievable to me. I couldn't believe that they wouldn't even follow Arizona, land, uh, Arizona law where is community property, whether there's a will or no will. They wouldn't recognize me as the legal heir to his property. But a change in administration and a change in the head of um, the BLM. And all of a sudden, things started to change. I would like to think that some of my speaking Engagements like with Paul, some of my representatives in Arizona, with Sylvia Allen. I would hope to think that some of that had something to do with it too. That finally somebody was listening and somebody was willing to start standing up and pushing for the right thing to be done. Because when we finally received a phone call from them after complete radio silence for nearly 18 months, they wanted to have it settled. ASAP. We couldn't, we couldn't understand the turnaround because for 18 months we've been sitting there, um, they were stonewalling us, refusing to even communicate with us on any level. So I was finally able to return to my ranch November 13, 2017, almost two years later. It has been wonderful to be back out there and to have my cows out on the range that they know. I, re I remember the day that we Rounded them all up, <laughs> rounded them all up, and unloaded them at Bobcat, and had a mile to push them into Tucker. And they practically ran all the way through those two gates. I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh my gosh, this isn't going to be hard work at all. I was a little concerned with just me and my daughter <laughs> and all these cows. And no, they knew that they were home, and they just ran to get there. And maybe I had a few ministering angels they're helping to push them on. I have fought to have my foster license reinstated. That took quite a doing. We lost our job the first week that my husband went up there. I have fought to have my husband's cattle brand preserved for our family. I have fought for the rights to my husband's book. We received threatening mail, hate, our family dealt with workplace retaliation. We have dealt with family and church members, judgments, ridicule, and isolation. There is a list of negative things that we have been through, but I won't go on. I choose to remember you lovely people who have loved me and who have continued to support our family throughout this horrific chain of events, who continue to remind me how wonderful we humans can be to and for each other. In traveling the country, speaking, I have been completely out of my element. I've had to study and learn to articulate my position, to have confidence and trust in the public square. I've gone from chuck wagon mom and grandmother to a woman rancher activist speaking on the national stage pretty much overnight after the death of my husband. 
I've had to learn how to ranch, ride horse, fix fence, drive and operate farm equipment, and a hundred other little things that have to do with ranching. Because again, I was the mom that took care of the kids and the city girl that married the cowboy, literally. It's Miss Kitty and Matt Dillon in our house. <laughs> and my little ramrod there, Tian, she homeschooled our last one. And so she spent almost every day with her dad learning all of what all she needed to know to help teach me. She's the greatest boss any girl can have. <laughs> and she's tough. But she's helped me to graduate from the grandkid horse to now I can ride my husband's horse. And now I know why he was riding that horse, because it's a really good horse. <laughs> I love ranching, and I didn't even know I was going to love it so much. And we can do hard things, right? And it doesn't matter how old we are, we can still do these things if we put our mind to it. I love being out on horse riding and being out in nature. I get it. I understand what he loves so much about being out there and riding with his cows. I still need a little pampering. And sometimes my kids pick up the slack there. And, um, I remember the first time out when we were pushing our cows across about 50 miles we were headed. And that first night we were getting ready to camp and I've been in the saddle all day and um, I haven't done that ever really. <laughs> So this was my first attempts at doing all of that, and I was pretty beat. And um, my daughters got out my bag, got out the padding that Dad always had for me, and put the cot up, put the padding out, and made all this comfort for me out in the middle of the desert, <laughs> just like he would have done. I'm grateful for the family that I have, for the kids that step up, I've had so many of you donate to our family in so many different ways. Whether it was just to send a card in the mail to say how much you loved us and how much you cared for us, to let, you know, to let us know that you were there, because sometimes we felt so alone, we didn't know that there were so many good people out there that loved us and was concerned for us. There were times when people sent money to help me feed those cows in that grazing lot, a five acre grazing lot with a hundred cows in there. That's a lot of hay. That's a lot of hay. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And you guys were there for me again. For the funeral cost, for the autopsy. For the many attorneys that I've had throughout a couple of years. You guys have been there. I've had my extended family that has been right beside me, right beside me the whole way, helping to help teach me the things that I needed to know, to lend me the land, to put my cows on it for those uh, five months. I've had my sister-in-law step in to put my cows out on her range for winter so that I wouldn't lose my, my herd and our heritage, and that way of life for my kids and for my grandkids. I've had many experts step up to, to help us in so many different fields. I've had other professionals such as editors, publishers, and personal consultants and media advisors. Our world changed overnight. And there was no way I was prepared to handle any of what we were facing. And you guys were there. You were all there. It has been hard, intimidating, frightening at times. But it has been and continues to be an amazing journey. And thank you. I'm grateful to have you. 
These words of a favorite hymn come to my mind. Though hard to you this journey may appear, grace shall be as your day. Gird up your loins, fresh courage take. God will never us forsake. Many have asked me over and over again, how do you keep going? And why aren't you angry? I think this hymn best describes how I feel and why I am not angry. Where can I turn for peace? Where is my solace? When other sources cease to make me whole, when with the wounded heart, anger, or malice, I draw myself apart, searching my soul. Where when my aching heart grows, where when I languish, where in my need to know, where can I run? Where is the quiet hand to calm my anguish? Who, who can understand? He, only one. He answers privately, and he reaches in my reaching, in my Gethsemane, Savior and friend. Gentle the peace he finds for my beseeching, constant he is in God, love without end. That is where I turn for my peace. That is where I turn for my solace. That is where I turn to turn over my anger. That is where I found peace. That's where I have found forgiveness. That's where I have found the strength to keep going each and every day. Because he is there. He is there next to me every day. I could not have done this without him. We cannot do this without him. This is his plan. He gave us this. He sent those men and inspired them to write that divine document. It is his. They have never left me alone. My Heavenly Father, my Savior. They have always been there, always carried me. Through the atonement, we can learn. We can learn to forgive and we can learn to trust. I am grateful for this opportunity to be here with you, to share just a little bit about my life with my husband why I have kept going, because we want justice and accountability. Because if we don't push forward, if we are the, just sit back and go home to our normal routine or whatever routine would come, who will pay the price next time? What other lives will be lost? I know that my Savior lives, and I know that he loves me. And I have a faith in the plan of salvation that I know that I will be with my husband again. And we will pick up where we left off. Except me, I will be a better horse rider when I see him next to me. <laughs> and we will ride like we wanted to ride here. We will have those memories and those times together that we didn't have here. We will have them. And I hope that he will say to me, Well done. Well done, Jeanette. Isn't he cute? <laughs> he, he never seemed to age that much. <laughs> it's not so. <laughs> he finally, finally lost all his hair. But <laughs> except that that, you can't tell. <laughs> um, that Sunday that I left up there at Malheur, um, I didn't want to leave. I was supposed to stay. He was so excited about the upcoming week. 
because Tuesday they were going to Sunday, and they knew that there was going to be a lot of people there. And they were so excited because they had an opportunity to continue to teach about the Constitution, what they were there for, because people were resonating with their message and they were excited about the opportunity and the possibilities of the turnaround. And then they were supposed to be in Boise that Saturday and I was to meet him there again. I was only going home to be there for my daughter's basketball game because it was senior recognition and he had written a letter for her to be read during senior recognition. And so, as Kathy was saying, I stopped along the way and visited with her and Bert and met them for the first time. And uh, I got home late that night. I remember speaking to my boy on the phone. And then the next day at my daughter's basketball game, we received the news that he had been murdered. And all of us were there. My father-in-law and mother-in-law, my son and my daughters. And it was such a horrific, horrific time. I should have been there with him, but I wasn't. He sent me home to make sure that I would be there for my daughter. And when he left, when I left that night, he said to me, I love you, Jeanette. Take courage, have faith. God is in charge. And he is. He is in charge. And as in Timothy, I hope that I can say that I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. I hope that in the end, I can say those things. I wish the boy was here to continue this move forward. He is in spirit. I feel him close to us <coughs> a lot, especially out on the horse. But I know that he's busy doing other work just as excited to do that work that he was doing the work here. I want to express again my gratitude for each one of you because I see so many good friends in this room. Those of you I didn't know two years ago and now I can call you dear friends. Dear sir, new friend. Thank you, Tom, for bringing me a new puppy into my life. I'm so excited to be able to train him and, and to take us, uh, take him with us on, on horse rides and, and, and teaching him to push cattle. I think my daughter's probably going to have to teach me how to do that. <laughs> right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being my extended family. Thank you for fighting this fight with us. Thank you for your continued support. Thank you for the love that you have shown me and my children. Thank you for holding us up and and supporting us all this time. We still have a battle ahead of us and we still have much to do. But I wanted to say thank you and God bless you all. Hey, Karen, how are you doing, cousin? And we are grateful for your strength and sacrifice and that you've taught us to stand as well. One of the things that uh, I really appreciated about the boy as I watched some of his YouTube videos, as I've spoken with his family, as I've gotten to know Tara, Tara is the one that introduced me to Jeanette to begin with. And when I first met Tara, she was so interested in learning about the founding of the country. She was reading all these founding documents. She was excited. It was infusing her with that desire to, to learn and have that spirit of liberty. And Lavoie was all about education, helping us learn how to be free because we can't be free without knowing. 
And uh, before I introduce our next speaker, I was going to share a quote from Thomas Jefferson. Because our, our next speaker is an educator as well. He, he will relate well with this quote, I believe. But Thomas Jefferson said, If a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. We must be educated. We must learn. And I'm grateful that we have these great examples that have spoken to us today to help us know where to go to find that knowledge. Our next speaker is Brian Hyde. Whether through the spoken or written word, Brian has become a familiar voice for the cause of liberty. His background includes more than 30 years as a radio commentator and 13 years as a regular columnist. During that time, he has sought to raise the level of discussion from bumper sticker slogans to serious discourse of the principles at stake. Brian has also worked as a professional public speaker, educator, and voiceover artist. He is a Salt Lake City native, and he and his wife are the parents of six children. And in fact, Brian um, hosted LaVoy on his show, and that uh, radio broadcast has become a great source to get insight into who LaVoy was. So with that, let's invite Brian up here. Doesn't it make a difference being able to hear Carol and Jeanette talk about their experiences? I mean, look, if everything we knew about the Bundy family and everything we knew about the Boy Finnegan was what we had been told by the media, how complete would that picture be? Not very. It would be a one-dimensional cartoon, wouldn't it? And it would be wrong. And it would be wrong. It would be dead wrong. So look at the difference. Look what happens when you are able to go to the source and hear from the source how things have happened. Now, I suspect most of you are here because at some level you've been following this story for some time. And I hope I'm safe in that assumption. But even so, with what you already do, you still need the time to come here tonight to go to the source, to hear these women speak, to relate their experience. And if, if there's one thing that I learned from my association with Ryan Bundy, um, some of you may not know this, but Ryan and I became friends uh, about 13 years ago when I moved to Cedar City. And he and I were part of a little group called Sons of Liberty. A guy by the name of Stephen Pratt encouraged us to get together on a regular basis and to teach one another the principles and practices of liberty. And we would meet every other Saturday morning, early in the morning, in a dark warehouse in a shady part of town. What they tell them? <laughs> there, there was something kind of felt quite nested about how, how we would meet in the, in the dark of the morning. But every single meeting, began and ended with prayer. And invariably in that prayer, at the beginning or the end, whoever was offered that prayer asked God, please help us make a difference. And over the course of a couple of years, it was astonishing, the sense of purpose that we could just feel started to distill on us. Now, I want you to understand, we were not out there to change the world. We were not gonna you know, overthrow the world and replace it with the kingdom of God. You know, uh, we, we just wanted to be a positive influence in our communities, in our families. Wherever we stood, we, this is the essence of leadership. It's using your influence wisely wherever you are right this moment. And that's what we asked for. And it was so amazing to watch opportunities come before us where we had individuals who uh, became city council members. We had uh, one become a county commissioner. Uh, most of the opportunities were not political in nature. They were just simply opportunities to serve. But one, one of the opportunities that this led to was four years ago, we stood together as a group with Anna and Ryan Bundy in a quiet field just south of the Bundy Ranch House prior to a very fateful day that most of you have probably heard about. What was amazing was we were part of a, a prayer that was offered on behalf of all of those who were standing for liberty that day. And I will tell you without shame. I came to know that day at a most personal level that the fight for liberty is God's fight. And I know that because we went to the source. God Almighty is the source of our liberty. And I watched as the, the bunnies courageously 
humbled themselves and sought for divine help. You've heard the term divine providence, right? It speaks to a, a greater plan. It speaks to a divine plan. And part of the divine plan that God has for his children is that liberty is one of the greatest gifts he has given us. And I suspect that the, most of you are here today because at some level you feel like you need to make a difference too. And so I'm just going to offer to you uh, the same kind of advice that, that others have offered here. If you want to understand the principles and practices of liberty, nothing will be going to the source, reading original sources. What the founders said in their own words, not what some textbook is interpreting or what some you know, modern interpretation of what they said is being you know, purported as this is what they really meant. But in their own words, they were prolific writers. Not only will you understand better what liberty is, but you'll understand better why it matters. And then, at a very individual level, I would encourage you, get on your knees and go to the source of your liberty and ask how you can become an instrument in helping to preserve liberty and perpetuate it for those generations that are going to follow. I say this with confidence only because I've seen it happen in my own life. Lavoie Bennett was an individual who had great moral clarity. Every time he came on the radio with me, we began with a word of prayer. If it's important enough that you were willing to put your life on the line or your, your fortune or your sacred honor, it's important enough to go to the source and seek out the direction for how you best can do it. And it's going to be different from person to person. I can't tell you what the role is that you're going to play. That would defeat the purpose of you being a leader. Find that goal. Go to the source. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Our uh, concluding speaker will be Joe Carey, who will give some closing remarks. And I've got to know Joe pretty well over the last year. And, you know, he, he makes me a lot cooler just you know, yeah. being able to say that I know him. <laughs> and he is a connector. He is very well connected with people that are well liked and well known. Uh, just a couple of things uh, that Joe's doing right now. He's the managing partner of Little Cloud. That's a strategic social media marketing company. He spent nearly 10 years as Glenn Beck's chief of staff, and he is also a New York Times and USA Today, USA Today number one best-selling author, co-authoring Common Sense with Glenn Beck. Joe brings people together, and he does very, he's very good at bringing people together, as we can see from this gathering tonight and many others that he's organized. So with that, let's welcome Joe Carey down to the stage. Hang the lawyer. I'll just admit attorneys. I am, uh, I think they say, all hat and no cattle. Um, <laughs> the, the first set of cowboy boots that I ever got was this year, and I'm wearing them today. No, you didn't hit you, you get it Women do when they get high heels for the first time. <laughs> I kept feeling I was going to fall forward. Um, but I realized a simple truth. Uh, why there are no fat cowboys. Uh, because then I had to take them off at night. And uh, I think I got one hernia and a fractured pancreas. Um, but eventually I had to call my daughter and say, Emily, I need to take off my boots. And then I understood the movies where, you know, you see the girl with the son pulling dad's boots off. Um, but I, I'm grateful to, uh, to be here today. But I am very new to the fight that many of you have been fighting for a very, very long time. And I don't want to make light of that fact. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have worked with uh, Carol and Jeanette and Kathy. Uh, but I have had a whirlwind of an education. I practiced law for 12 years in Philadelphia. Um, I never really understood the fight that was taking place on this half of the country. I mean, open space in New York City and Philadelphia is 
you know, you're looking over Central Park in New York City, and you're like, wow, that's open space. And then you go to Bunkerville, and you realize, wow, no, that wasn't open space. So I appreciate your patience with me, but I just wanted to share something with you. And I imagine that this group bit's okay if you have a Philadelphia guy talking about the Bible. Is that okay? Just a little bit. But it might be a little bit uh, off. But let me tell you something that I realized. I was traveling with a good friend, and he said, Joe, what do you know about the prophet Elijah? I said, okay, that's a fair question. I know he's coming back, but that's about it. And I know the Mormons believe he has come back, and the Jews believe he is coming back. And that was really my knowledge of Elijah. So I started to read everything I could on this man because in the New Testament, it tells us that Elijah is a man like unto us. He's a man like you and me. And I didn't understand that because here's a man that raised a child from the dead. Here's a man that lived his life so he never tasted death. We're told in the Bible that a chariot came down from heaven, scooped him up in a whirlwind, and took him back to heaven. Well, how is a man like that? Like me? So Elijah was told, hey, I have a mission for you. You need to go to King Ahab and confront the king. And Ahab wasn't just any wicked king. The Bible tells us he was the most wicked king. When God destroyed Jericho, right, the prophet said, God commands you not to rebuild this city. What did King Ahab do? He rebuilt it. So here's a man that just didn't fear God. He mocked God. And Elijah is told, I want you to go confront this king. And in many ways, I think, as I read that story again, I thought of Clive and Bundy. I thought of the boy. Right? Because who's the modern day king? Right? Isn't it the government? Isn't it the BLM? Isn't it the FBI and the ATF and some of the abuses that are coming from there? But Elijah didn't complain. He didn't run. He went to the king and he told the king, because of the wickedness you've done, God is going to punish you. And much like government today, when they're confronted with their abuse, when they're confronted with their overreach and their excess, what happens? Do they back down? Right? Do they say, oh my gosh, I didn't know we were doing that. <laughs> if only we were told us sooner. Well, what do they do? They try to stand up taller, become more angry, become more aggressive, tell you the land is not yours, the water is not yours, that these rights don't apply to you. That's exactly what they have to hold Elijah. So Ahab says, off with his head. And God tells Elijah, run. But he tells him where to run to. And it's a place that everyone in this room has been to. Everyone in this room, I don't know you, but I know you've been there. Because the place that God told Elijah to go to was a tiny, tiny remote place called Cherub. No one was, it's like Bunkerville. No one was there. <laughs> Just the <buttons. laughs> And it's so remote and so barren that God commands the ravens to feed Elijah. And Elijah's told, there's going to be a stream that you can drink from. There was no family. There was no friends. There was no one. And if you're in this room and supporters of the Bundys and the Finnegans, you know what it's like when you go to a neighbor or a relative or a family member and say what? They're good people. What's the reaction? Right? That's your bit of charity, which is this is common sense to me. I sat in the trial next to Brian Hyde, who was covering this event every day. And I walked in, not a skeptic, but not a believer. I mean, here's the government telling the federal judge, there are no snipers at Bunkerville. <laughs> and I'm listening, I'm thinking, okay, he's the acting U.S. Attorney <coughs> for the state of Nevada, 
And he's telling the judge under the roof, there's no snipers. I've been brought up in the United States. I don't know what in Philadelphia, but the U.S. attorney is saying there's no snipers. My bias is what? No snipers. There's no snipers. <laughs> then, after three months, all of a sudden, wait, we have photos. <laughs> that looks like, I mean, I'm not a military guy, but it looks like this. It looks like a memo comes out. And more evidence comes out. And I'm sitting there, I struggle with it. I'm thinking, wait a second. I'm I've been raised to believe these institutions. And I think many times there are many people in those institutions who try to do the right thing. But as this trial unfolded, I saw more and more, let's be polite and call them inconsistencies. <laughs> <laughs> Lies and fabrication. I know and Carol and Jeanette want to meet all of you in the, uh, the foyer area. All of us have been to Cherif. We know what it's we know what it's like to be alone for our principles and for our beliefs. We know that feeling. But some of us are called to go a step further, and that's what happened to Elijah. Because after Elijah said Cherif, we don't know how long he was there, but the impression is he was there for years by himself. No family, no friends, being fed by the ravens. Then God tells him. You need to get up and you need to leave. And Elijah's relieved. Finally, what does God send him? Sends him to enemy territory, to Sarapet. You know, I can only imagine, well, you've got to be kidding me. I thought I was going to go back home. I thought my mission was done. I had gone to family and friends. No. You go into enemy territory where they hate the Jews. And so he obeys. Just like when little boy felt, no, it's right for me to go. I don't know why I need to go, but it's why I need to make this trek. When Clive and his son said, I don't know why, but we can't give up this fight. We've got to do whatever it takes. So Elijah Keep goes to Zarephath. And the drought has been going on three years. There's no rain. We're told in the Bible, not only was there no rain, there was no dew in the morning. Everybody starving. There's no water. If there's no water, there's no food. So Elijah goes and he sees a woman at a well. And God says, go to that woman and tell her to fetch you some water. That doesn't sit well, very well today in the correct world. He told this woman, okay, God, can you fetch some water? What does the woman say? What does she say? She says, okay, I'll, I'll do it. So she's fetching the water, and then Thank what does Elijah okay. say? Well, since you're fetching the water, why don't you make me some bread? I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy's got a death wish. <laughs> <laughs> and her response is, I'm here to get a little bit of water. So I can make a little bit of bread. And die. So I can share it with my son. And then we plan on dying. Because there's no food. We are not called, many of us are not called, as the Wineys and the Phoenicians have been, to go to Zarephath. But each of us, each of us is that woman at the well. And each of us have a responsibility to what? To give, to help, to sustain. That's what most of us will be called to do. It's to sustain and support the Barnabas and the Thanagos in their mission. Check and said, you know what? We're going to cover the cost tonight. Why? So every dollar that you spend on a ticket can go to these two families and the causes they believe in. So that we love them. Thank you for that. Yeah. Hi, Donna. Yeah.
God bless the Dundas. The Fittacombs. Uh, Elm Patriots. You're going to have the opportunity to support that. I would ask that you do it because that's what you can do. <clears throat> you know, what can I do? How can I help? The answer is here. One, I want to thank you very much for coming out tonight. It means the world to, to me and to Peter, to Carol, and to Ned, uh, and to see them laugh. It's amazing to me. It's humbling. Thank you very much. Constitution with Lavoie on the front, and uh, we're going to be having Carol and Jeanette signing them, and they'll be available for purchase for ten dollars out there. So I hope that you'll go. I hope that you'll go and talk with these wonderful women, talk with their families, and enjoy the time out in the foyer as we wrap up and have the you know an opportunity for book signing and so forth. So once again, thank you for coming, for traveling from out of state, for coming to support these wonderful families. Thank you, Brian. I know this pretty lady right here. I'm live streaming. I say everybody knows this pretty lady right Hi, here. Vincent. Oh, thanks, Vincent. <laughs> I'm looking for the puppy. Do you know where they took the puppy? Uh, that way, up to the left corner. <laughs> they was there. So he might have went through the doorway back there, down the hallway. No name yet. I bet if you go through the doorway, Wendy, you'll find him. Yeah. So Rage and TP, that's somebody new I don't know. Might be a Fogbo guest. Thefogbo.com. To uh, if you're keeping up with the patties, of course they call us the Poots. That's uh, Patriots overthrowing oppressive tyrants. That's the anagram I gave that, with a little help from uh, Brand and uh, Captain Carl. And Patty's stands for position attempt to terminate individual entities' sovereignty. So the Poots versus the Patties, where were you stand? Remember, it does matter how you stand. Let's turn it around. I normally don't. Shoot me, but why not? There. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for uh, well coming in for the listen. Not sure how long it was. Probably an hour and a half, maybe, or a little more. Had a little pre-warm up, and Brian Hyde did the introduction for me. Let's back up. Thanks. RealLibertyMedia.com. If I'm getting a shot of that. You are welcome to share this video in its entirety and for our attribution uh, back to that source.
no, no cutting or clipping like uh, Channel 8 in Las Vegas did to Carol Bundy. We're taking words out of context, out of anybody, what anybody said here. So, again, uh, I hope you all will share. Load it, download it, upload it, share it around. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm scanning the crowd. It's still on me. Turn around. Don't turn around. Uh-oh. Somebody's left for a magazine. All right, well, maybe this was a little better, not near as shaky. And we'll sign off for now. Thanks, everybody.